Hello. Uh, today I'll be talking about some objections to virtue ethics. Um, as you might anticipate, there are uh, always objections to every major ethical theory. And in general, we take a look at the objections to ethical theories in order to understand them better uh, with the understanding that they're, they're, they're good enough theories to have generated objections that are really worth serious discussion. Uh, and virtue ethics is no different. I'll be following the text, uh, the Schaeferlandau text, fairly closely on this one, uh, but I'll be adding uh, in a couple of things to it. So here we go. First, let's talk about what's known as the, uh, what Schaefer Landau calls the, the tragic dilemmas argument. And again, this is right out of the text. He says, um, if virtue ethics is the correct account of morality, then uh, a choice in a tragic dilemma, uh, he references uh, uh, Sophie's choice as an example, uh, is morally right and morally praiseworthy. Now, if you don't know uh, Sophie's choice, uh, he does briefly describe in the text. You could also Google it or even better see the film. It's something of a major cultural touchstone, so uh, something you should probably know about anyway. Uh, premise two is that it is neither, and then the conclusion, therefore, virtue ethics is not the correct account of morality. So the thought behind this is something like if uh, somebody in, for example, so uh, faced with Sophie's choice uh, ends up, you know, choosing, uh, then in a sense, uh, you know, the, the virtuous person would probably, you know, make one choice or another. Uh, and Sophie's choice would act as the virtuous person does. And so you want to praise them for like choosing one of their children to die instead of the other one. Sorry if I spoiled anything for you. Uh, but um uh, uh, that doesn't seem praiseworthy. It doesn't seem like a right uh, action. And so that's the, the thought behind this tragic dilemmas argument. Of course, uh, usually the ones he starts out with aren't the strongest arguments, and uh, this one this one is, is no exception. Uh, the virtue ethicist has a reasonable response here. Uh, in fact, uh, as as with any of these arguments, if an argument is valid, and the and, and that one is uh, certainly in structure, uh, the, the only way to disagree with its conclusion is to disagree with at least one of the premises. And in this case, each of these premises really may be criticized. So it may be that if somebody says, you know, look, you know, so, some, you know, somebody, some mad, crazy person, you know, comes and, you know, has a gun and says, I, you know, uh, choose between your two children. I'm going to shoot one of them and it's going to be whichever one you choose. And if you don't choose anybody, I'm going to shoot them both. It may well be that the virtuous person would simply not participate in such a thing, right? Uh, regardless of what the what possible consequences there are. It says, look, this isn't what, I, like, I am not doing anything here, you know? In fact, we see, we see, we see uh, villains uh, give heroes choices like this in Hollywood all the time. And in Hollywood, the, 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 the hero always tries to just, you know, like, really escape the situation entirely. And most of the time, the script writers are, you know, complicit in that. And they go ahead and let that happen instead of having, like, real major dilemmas happen, which, you know, every now and then they do. But one thing I really wish they'd do more often is uh, have somebody just refuse. Say, no, this is your crazy game. I'm not playing it. And if you're just going to shoot people, you're going to shoot people. If I can't stop you, I can't stop you. I'm not playing along. I am not going to be involved in the causal chain here. If you're crazy, you're going to just be crazy, and I'm going to have no part of it. That's my instinct of what the virtuous person would do in the consequent in this situation. Um, it's not Schaefer Landau. So he, he mentions this as a possibility, but he, he thinks that uh, the second uh, 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 criticism is, is much better. And he says, well, look, he says you can, uh, perhaps the virtuous person really would make such a decision in that case because it seems like better than doing nothing. Uh, you know, making making decision to save somebody's life is better than, uh, you know, sort of just, you know, sitting on one's hands or being squeamish or something like that. I don't know, I, I, I tend to prefer the first option. In any case, if I think the first option is the better option and, and it, it indicates that that first premise is false. Um, Schaefer Landau thinks that the second uh, uh, option is, you know, actually making a choice there is the sort of thing the virtuous person would do, in which case the second premise is false. Either way, I think the, the virtue ethicist has a plausible response here. Uh, we, we could defend uh, either action, some action or other or inaction as, as a virtuous, uh, 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 as, the, as the virtuous act uh, or the act of the virtuous person in either case, right? So again, this isn't a great argument against virtue ethics. Uh, but it's but he mentions it so 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 will I. Uh, a much better uh, uh, argument, a much better objection that, that, that people tend to have to virtue ethics um, is uh, because virtue ethics is a pluralist approach to morality. Uh, 
And because it's a pluralist approach to morality, it faces the same criticism that other pluralist approaches face. It faces, for example, the same criticism that W.D. Ross's system of ethics had, that it provides uh, uh, insufficient moral guidance. That is, it doesn't do enough to tell you in some particular situation what you're supposed to do. Uh, it's certainly less formulaic and handy than either Kant's nice rules or, or the utilitarian calculus or something like that. And that's a fair point. But of course, like other pluralist approaches, virtue ethics can avail itself of the responses that, um, that, that for example, W.D. Ross gave, uh, that at the level of selecting a moral theory to begin with, we also have no definite moral formula. So if you're already a utilitarian, well, then you have a nice handy moral formula. If you're already a Kantian, then you have the categorical imperative, this nice handy little moral formula. But if you don't really know which moral theory is even the best one, you just have to think about it very carefully, see what various moral theories have, you know, going for them and try and do the best you can in a particular case. Uh, that's, you know, and I, I think, again, that's a perfectly fair response. I think it's a good response. Uh, when Ross uses it, it should be equally good if a virtue ethicist uses it uh, to answer the same challenge. Not to say that it isn't a real challenge, but it, it does have a reasonable response from the virtue ethicist. Uh, next, we have this idea of uh, the vir virtue ethics being very demanding. Okay. Uh, uh, Schaefer Lando brings up a couple of examples that are pretty poignant. He talks about, uh, you know, uh, Gandhi, right, going on a, a right of hunger strikes that, uh, you know, darn near killed him. Um, and, and he did so uh, in order to achieve something of, of lasting and, and, and great importance. Um, you know, and so it, the, the sort of virtues that might Im that, that impel at least some people to, uh, you know, tremendous self-sacrifice and self-discipline and, and sometimes, uh, you know, a life that isn't the most comfortable, but is in fact a good life, I think few would disagree that Gandhi led a good life, uh, that uh, that can be tough, right? And it might be very challenging and there, there's a lot to virtue and it's a very, very, very high standard uh, to be, you know, that, that virtue ethics has. And that goes into the kind of demandingness. And notice this is the same kind of demandingness that applies to utilitarian moral theory. Uh, and you might say, well, gosh, isn't utilitarian theory too demanding? Right, and that's the objection. And the objection applies to virtue ethics as well. Is is the ideal too lofty? Right? Is it a little? Is it, is it unrealistic? Um, you know, is that a problem? Okay. And of course, just like the utilitarian virtue ethic, the virtue ethicist can respond that, look, any good moral theory ought to be demanding. They're saying, they're going to say, look, what do you want from us? <laughs> uh, we're 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 going to we're gonna, giving you an ideal. And yes, an ideal is an ideal. It may be even impossible to reach, uh, but that's what an ideal is for. It's it's to it's to get closer to it, right? And and so any good moral theory perhaps should be uh, perhaps strictly unreachable, um, even if even if you can get closer and closer to it. Right. So it's possible that virtue ethics is too demanding, uh, just like it's possible that utilitarianism is too demanding. But both virtue ethics and utilitarianism respond to this criticism in the same way. They say, look, what do you want from us? It's a moral ideal. It should be. It should be uh, demanding. And so now we get into the section of uh, the Schaefer Landau text that I, uh, I'm, I'm going to raise some, some problems with this. Uh, uh, again, I think that overall, Schaefer Landau does a really outstanding job, uh, but it's impossible to find any book that everybody agrees with literally everything in, right? And if, if somebody does agree with literally everything in a particular book, either it's a really short book about some very basic stuff, uh, or somebody's not thinking hard enough. So uh, there are some things I disagree with in this uh, section of this chapter, and I'll, I'll detail what they are after trying to give uh, Schaefer Landau a, a fair explanation. And so uh, he brings up this thing called like this contradiction problem. He says, what happens when two virtuous people behave differently in some situation, right? Doesn't that mean that the same act, if we're defining an act as what the virtuous person would do, right? Uh, doesn't that mean that the same act would be virtuous and not virtuous at the same time, or that it's morally acceptable and not morally acceptable at the same time? Uh, that would be a major problem if it was a problem. And, and he gets it out of the problem by saying, okay, well, whatever all of the virtuous people do, um, that that's what was morally acceptable. What, you know, what only some of the virtuous people do, well, that's morally permissible, but not, but not ob obligatory, right? And yes, that technically does resolve the contradiction problem, but I, I feel like this is a pseudo problem. It's not a problem uh, to begin with. So, uh, 
and and you'll notice that right here he starts to sound like Euthyphro, right? When Euthyphro said like, oh, you know, no, what's holy is what's loved by the gods, and and our Aristotle says, well, don't they disagree, right? Um, and then he says, okay, fine. Then what's what's holy is what's loved by all the gods, right? And so uh, if you if you've drawn that parallel already, good move, right? Good thinking because that's exactly where Schaefer Landau is going. Uh, but here's the t here's here's the deal. This objection, this contradiction problem only gets off the ground if we try and say, okay, what we're, what we're doing with virtue ethics is trying to make it about actions. If we're trying to say the actions that are right or wrong, and it's the actions that are right or wrong, and the way you tell which action is right or wrong is by which act the virtuous person would take, okay? I've always had a problem with people describing virtue ethics this way, and I, I have a problem with it here. And I think the, the, some of the problems that you get for virtue ethics are just a symptom of that approach, okay? This objection only gets off the ground if you try to make virtue ethics into a theory about actions instead of a theory about character. Virtue ethics is a different approach to ethics. It's fundamentally different, and it's different in the sense that a virtue ethicist does not care about actions primarily. We're not worried about which acts are right and wrong. Uh, it's not a theory of what to do. It's a theory of how to be, okay? It is a theory of what kind of character traits one should cultivate and possess, not necessarily a, a, a choice of what to do. Yes, very often in life we find ourselves faced with, uh, you know, choices of what to do, but the idea is that if we have already spent our time cultivating the right character, then those actions will take care of themselves, right? And so, again, virtue ethics isn't primarily a theory about actions, and that's why I don't think this, this objection is a very good objection, because it, tries to, it, it only succeeds by making virtue ethics into something that it isn't. Same thing with the follow-up, right, the priority problem. Remember uh, just a, a minute ago where I said uh, that, that it starts to sound a little bit like Euthyphro, right? Um, where, you know, Euthyphro says, oh, what's holy is what's loved by uh, the gods, right? And, and uh, Socrates says, well, th don't, don't they disagree, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, the, you know, Euthyphro says, okay, fine, uh, they do sometimes disagree. So how about uh, holiness is what's loved by all the gods, right? And that gets me out of it. And then uh, Socrates gives him, you know, this this uh, Euthyphro dilemma, says, okay, well, look, either things are good because, you know, uh, the gods love them or the gods love them because they're good, right? Um, and if it's the first, then the good is arbitrary and that sucks. And if it's the second, then um, then the good just doesn't depend on the gods, right? So schaefer is going to make the very, very same move here uh, coming out of uh, the, the previous previous uh, objection. He's going to talk about this priority problem, uh, uh, and he's going to contend that uh, that it's, it's just like the Euthyphro dilemma, uh, in the sense that either acts are moral because the virtuous person does them, and thus arbitrary, because like, you know, if there's nothing about some action that is in itself good or bad, it's just, oh, well, that's what the virtuous person would do, right? Then it's, um, you know, although, again, how do we decide they're the virtuous person, right? Uh, and that, that's something else that, again, this objection doesn't consider. Uh, and so the other horn of the dilemma is that, uh, you know, well, I guess uh, things are good for some other reason other than that the virtuous person does them and thus the good is independent of virtue, right? Um, or morality is independent of virtue. So you see the, uh, again, the way that he applies the Euthyphro dilemma. Um, and the Euthyphro dilemma does indeed apply to many, many bad moral theories. I just don't think it applies to virtue ethics, again, because the claim is not that the action is good and it's good because the virtuous person does it. The claim is that it's the character trait that's good. It's the virtue itself that's good, right? And any actions, right, that come from that virtue, again, are beside the point. Virtue ethics is, is, a, is a theory about how to be, not a theory about um, a, a, about what to do, okay? And so again, we notice that this objection only works if we try and make virtue ethics about actions rather than character itself. Furthermore, uh, virtue ethics does actually have reasons for differentiating virtues from vices. Remember uh, the whole method that Aristotle went through to help us tell the difference uh, between a virtue and a vice, right? And keep in mind the uh, the argument about um, uh, about you know the forms of life, right? The sort of you know uh, uh, argument that Aristotle has about why virtue is uh, the life of virtue is is the best life for a person, right? Uh, this 
uh, you know, he, there, there, there are separate arguments about that. The virtues are grounded in other things. Uh, they're not simply arbitrary and they're not uh, just an outgrowth, right? Not something, you know, uh, we really are a, a appealing to real actual methods and arguments here. And this objection does ignore a lot of that. I don't think it's a very good objection, uh, though it appears when you read the, the text that Schaefer Landau thinks of it as more or less a decisive objection against virtue ethics. Um, again, I, I very much disagree. I think it misses, uh, it misses the mark. All right, so I also want to I want to bring up a couple of criticisms of virtue ethics that I think are somewhat better and also are fairly mainstream, uh, but that Schaefer Landau does not include uh, in this particular chapter. So one of these objections to virtue ethics, uh, let's call it the virtuous villains uh, objection, uh, nicely alliterative, okay? Uh, and so the idea is that you know think of some examples, right? You know Hitler, who is for all time now just a universal villain, uh, he was certainly self-disciplined, right? He was otherwise very determined. Uh, but of course, he did not aim those otherwise virtuous qualities very well. Uh, Lex Luthor, the fictional supervillain, certainly is courageous, very clever. Um, and so the question is, should those things be counted as virtues, right? Should Hitler's self-discipline, determination, should Lex Luthor's cor courageousness or, you know, courage and, um, uh, and cleverness, are, are those virtues <laughs> in spite of the uses to which they were put? Um, and and if if you're in something of a bind as a virtue ethicist in this case, if you say, well, yes, those are virtues, uh, then you have to defend why virtues can cause such bad stuff, right? And if you say, well, no, they aren't virtues because they cause bad things to happen, then you're like, well, then what? Why aren't you just a consequentialist, right? Um, you know, and and I don't know that you have a great answer to that. So so this is a pretty good objection. Um, and again, unless it's, it seems like unless we account for the acts and their consequences, we can't really make a distinction uh, between these virtues and, and what would otherwise be vices. Right? But of course, uh, the virtue ethicist does have some reasonable response to this very good objection. Those responses are as follows. Right? So first off, remember that, that virtue ethics is pretty holistic, right? It deals with sort of the whole person in a whole context, taken over a whole life, right? So you, you want to take into account not just one feature at a time, you want to take in the entire character of a person. And so certainly courage and cleverness really are virtues, right? And I think one thing you might say in the cases of these villains, like, you know, uh, uh, Hitler or Lex Luthor or something like that, uh, are that those virtues were overcome Right by vices of excess like megalomania or avarice, uh, or vices of deficiency of empathy or you know deficiency of plenty of other things too. Okay, uh, and so so the idea is that you know all in all you might say that even though some of these folks possessed some virtues, that they possessed a lot of vices as well, and that's the more important part of the story. So that's one way that a, a virtue ethicist can talk about uh, sort of virtuous villains, as it were. Uh, or, as a virtue ethicist, you can simply deny that that uh, that uh, Lex Luthor's courage is is a virtue at all. Uh, Philip Afoot is one uh, person who gives a, a famous account of this, uh, and here I've just uh, quoted the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy because they've written a really excellent entry um, on uh, on Philip Afoot's moral thought here, and and sums it up in a, in a sentence uh, very cleanly. And so I, I why you know why do better than this? So I'm just going to quote it. Um, uh, the quote is, runs as follows. On Foote's account, there are three essential features of a virtue, right? Three things that make something count as a virtue. First, a virtue is a disposition of the will, right? That matches the definition we have earlier in this course. Second, it is beneficial either to others or to its possessor as well as others. We tend to cover that when we say it's a good character trait, a good stable disposition to act. And then she adds this third criterion that it is corrective of some bad general human tendency. Right? It's a very interesting way to look at virtues. And if you're, you're curious about that, uh, you should uh, look up uh, Philip Foote's uh, famous work, uh, Virtues and, and, and Vices. Um, and, uh, and 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 or or look up some other summary of it, uh, etc. Just you know, uh, type in you know Philip of Foot, uh, you know, uh, uh, corrective virtue, and you'll find it, right? You'll find uh, some some good discussions of that. Um, but it's a, it's a really it's a really excellent excellent argument. But we'll go ahead and leave it there. We'll say that yeah, you know that that can present the virtuous villains presents a couple of worrisome cases, some things to puzzle over. But again, the virtue ethicist has a reasonable response. One of the other very common kinds of objections, I think a very powerful objection to virtue ethics, is uh, what we're going to what we could call the relativist challenge, right? 
And so, again, the way it goes is this. Because cultural relativism, which we covered very early in this term, is a bad moral theory, it would follow that if virtue ethics just is relativism in disguise, right, if that's all it amounts to, uh, then virtue ethics is a bad moral theory, uh, just just like you know uh, cultural relativism. So the idea is, if you want to say that virtue re virtue ethics is just relativism, then that means that virtue ethics will have the same problems as relativism, and since those problems make it simply a bad moral theory, that that virtue ethics would then be a bad moral theory. Okay, so let's motivate this uh, uh, this challenge a little bit. Let's motivate this objection. Why would somebody say that virtue ethics is just relativism in disguise? Right. Well, here's why. So if you take a look at some of the different ideals of virtue in lots of different settings, like different times, different places, uh, you know, sometimes from literature, sometimes from history, whatever. So if you look at these sort of chivalric tales, like the tales of like, you know, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, uh, there are many of these, of course. But, you know, sort of if you just think of the, the general story, the kinds of virtues that people give are things like, you know, bravery and, uh, you know, devotion to God and, uh um, uh, uh, strength and, and, and steadfastness and, you know, uh, all these, you know, uh, in a lot of ways, martial virtues, like the virtues of, of soldiers or warriors, in, in a sense. I mean, these are the things that are valuable in terms of uh, character traits. But notice uh, the set of virtues uh, that are uh, good for, say, a monk <laughs> uh, in, in, you know, in a monastery of roughly the same time period. Uh, things like humility and poverty and chastity and meekness, you know, and, 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 and all that sort of stuff. That's very, very different from all these more uh, uh, martial virtues of, of the Knights of the Round Table. And still, again, if you look at the novels of Jane Austen, for example, uh, you see sort of, you know, cleverness and charm and wit, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, all these sorts of things. Are, these, are, these are very different sets of, of virtues. Uh, and of course, in all of these circumstances, very different virtues are applied to both men and to women. Um, uh, and of course, if you look at Aristotle's case, you know, he, he gives you a, a kind of set of core virtues, he gives you a method. Uh, but isn't it possible that instead of giving us an idea of what the good life for a person is, right, or, or, or what a good, a, a good character looks like, might he really just be giving us an idea of what a good, what, what character is for a fourth century BC Greek man, right? I mean, is that really all that's going on? That's, I mean, that's a very serious challenge. Uh, after all, cultural relativism is, is a terrible moral theory. And if, if virtue ethics is just that, then it's also, it's, it's also sunk. And so uh, the virtue ethicist has to take this objection very, very seriously indeed. And so uh, I, I want to sketch out the response, even though it's, uh, you know, the response is both made and, um, uh, or described at least, and defended in, in much more detail in, in other work. So uh, what I would recommend is taking, if you're really interested in this particular objection to virtue ethics, uh, to take a look at uh, Martha Nussbaum's very excellent uh, article called Non-Relative Virtues. Again, you can find it on the interwebs. Um, and uh, what it is, is it's, it's a sketch of the, the relativist challenge to virtue ethics, as well as a kind of answer. And, and here's what she says. She says that, that Aristotle himself certainly right, had some elements of his theory, some elements of his idea that were purely local in origin uh, or that, that were you know, very much uh, just part of you know, his, his particular time and place, but that his method itself uh, was was more transcendent, okay? And it's pretty clear that Aristotle himself advocated a kind of non-relativist approach to ethics, right? And and of course we can do the same as as, as well. Um, Aristotle did not intend for for his theory to be, oh, this is the way things are here, right? Among the people I'm used to um, and the people that I like, or something like that. He again, he tried to be more objective and may have not succeeded in every case, but that's certainly uh, part of what he's really trying to do here. So, for example, Aristotle did advocate a single view of human well-being. He criticized uh, past mores, right, you know, past uh, uh, cultural attitudes, uh, in some cases for being, uh, uh, quote unquote, obviously stupid. Uh, uh, one, one example, he says, you know, can you believe that Greeks, you know, Greek men used to walk around armed all the time. They used to wear swords everywhere. Uh, and he, you know, again, he thought as a cultural cultural uh, uh, practice that was just stupid. Um, and uh, it was much more dangerous for everybody to walk around with weapons than for nobody to walk around with weapons. Um, 
and so uh, that's that's the idea, right? So you know, again, he's trying to be objective here. He's criticizing even his own society, and of course, he criticized other societies for having uh, uh, cultural mores which ignored facts about general overall human well-being and about at least some of the important virtues. And so, certainly, his intent was to make a more objective kind of moral theory to base the virtues on at least something objective, and it, it's clear that his method at least allows that. And so uh, uh, what Martha Nussbaum does, it's really very, very nicely done in my opinion, is uh, that she sort of modifies Aristotle's approach or sort of generalizes from Aristotle's approach uh, to give us a way that we can advocate virtues uh, without necessarily worrying about uh, sort of their more relativist, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, an accusation of relativism. Right. And so the idea is to find some universal sphere of human experience. That is, find something that everybody, no matter what culture they're in, no matter how they grow up, no matter who their friends are, no matter what language they speak, that they experience. Right. And and, and I think you can probably think of plenty of these. Uh, we'll talk about a sort of list that, that, uh, that Nussbaum comes up with later. And she says, what you want to do is you want to identify the essential features of that share sphere of experience. That's what, what about that experience is universal for everybody and what seems to be good for everybody in that, uh, in that sphere of experience and what seems to be bad for everybody in that experience. Again, uh, absent any cultural assumptions. Then you want to, again, use this next Aristotelian, Aristotelian method of identifying the adjectives that describe positive and negative attributes with respect to that sphere of, of, of experience. Remember, this is what uh, Aristotle always says, look, think of the way that people describe other people. You know which one of which of those descriptors are good descriptors. You know which, which of those descriptors are bad ones. You know it's bad if someone calls you a coward. You know it's good if someone calls you courageous, right? And so, again, those th th then you have to worry about, all right, where do they fit on a spectrum? What do these things have to do with each other? And you sort of build up from there. And that's step four, to organize those features as describing a virtue, okay, uh, or some vice of deficiency, or else some vice of excess. Uh, keeping in mind that at least some virtues may not admit of vices of excess or deficiency. Uh, for example, wisdom is a virtue and it just doesn't have a, a, a vice of excess, right? It doesn't appear to be harmful ever to be too wise, to know too much, right? Uh, the more knowledge and wisdom you have, the better. And so again, uh, 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 Nussbaum herself considers some very powerful objections to, um, to this, this kind of an approach. And one of those objections uh, is that maybe uh, our, our tastes right, are conditioned by the cultures in which we live, right? Certainly, um, you know, uh, she gives a lot of very good examples of this, a lot of, uh, you know, very good cases and arguments that people have made for this. Uh, and this certainly seems to be the case with art and music and even certain things like, like body image. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, sort of ancient art, you'll see sometimes body images uh, that are, uh, you know, a lot different than the kind of body images that are celebrated now um, in you know sort of the present day uh, in in you know our particular culture you see uh, you know very different art very different music um, you know in in various different places and and again you don't have to be that culturally aware to be aware of at least some of that sorts of things so again maybe it's that our our tastes are conditioned and so the kinds of things that we find to be sort of positive or negative in most cases again maybe that's just sort of this cultural thing perhaps we'll you know again we'll get we'll get to that. Uh, another objection is that it may be that our virtues are artifacts of non-necessary aspects of human life. For example, you might say generosity as a virtue, right? You, you want to be generous, right? You don't want to be too generous, so generous that you're reckless, uh, and you don't want to be so ungenerous that you're, you know, like stingy or miserly or something like that. So you, you want to have this nice, uh, mean virtue of uh, generosity. You want to sort of uh, you not have too much of it, not have too little of it. Um, but notice generosity is really only a virtue if there's some concept of something like private property, uh, which might be a kind of dysfunctional social element that we could or should do without. So imagine, right, that perhaps the best possible moral code is not a moral code that, uh, that involves private property. Right? That would be very different from, uh, you know, uh, the, at least the vast majority of human societies uh, that I can think of. Um, you know, maybe there have been some societies that had no concept of personal property. I'm not sure. You'd have to ask a, an anthropologist about that one. Uh, certainly, um, uh, many cultures, if not most, if not all, have had some concept of personal property. But it may, maybe, maybe that's simply um, uh, contingent. Right? It's something you know, a society doesn't have to have that and perhaps even shouldn't. 
And so if you have a, a, a virtue that requires something like private property that for the sake of argument, we can say is, you know, maybe immoral, right? Uh, then, then that virtue would not really be a virtue, even though we followed our method to get it or something like that. Okay. So this is where, uh, where Nussbaum, the way that Nussbaum answers both of these kinds of challenges, which again are very serious challenges, uh, very creative, very well described, uh, is that she says, look, we have to, you have to be really careful in steps one and two of your process. Right. If you remember that that's finding some sphere of like some some universal sphere of human experience, something that everybody really does experience and that what's good for people uh, and, and bad for people is the same no matter what your cultural uh, 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 your cultural background, um, uh, in, no matter, you know, sort of how strange it is. And so she comes up with a kind of uh, basic list of these kinds of things. Um, and so uh, this is where. Uh, we're gonna uh, we're gonna go into the list here, okay? Uh, she says that you know that there's she thinks that there are a set of truly universal spheres of human experience and suggests that Aristotle's approach, when adapted to these things, is much uh, is is an effective and very non-relative approach. Um, so so again, here are some of uh, here's her list. Uh, these are her universal spheres of human experience. Again, this may may or may not be exhaustive. I, I think she says, look, I'm not trying to be exhaustive here, but this is a pretty good candidate list. And again, I think she does a pretty good job. Uh, so mortality, right? Everybody dies, okay? And pretty much everybody comes to the realization before they do that they're going to die someday, right? Uh, that's that's as universal as it gets. Now, of course, different, you know, like, you know, funeral customs or different experiences, different ways to talk about or think about death, uh, you know, the various sort of rituals and ceremonies, a lot of that's culturally, uh, you know, relative and, and, and that differs by culture, but the fact of death isn't culturally relative, okay? That, that has nothing to do with culture. Uh, the body, okay? We all have pretty much the same kind of body plan, you know, uh, at least in, in the standard case, two arms, two legs, doesn't matter what culture you're in, you've got a body and it's a human body and that's that, okay? Uh, also pleasures and pains. Pleasures and pains are, are pleasures and pains. Uh, and, and maybe you don't think necessarily about the more fuzzy sort of emotional things, something, things that are emotionally pleasing or emotionally painful. Just think about like the, literally, you know, like when you touch a hot stove, that pain, right? Uh, or when you, you know, pet a nice furry kitten and you know, that's, 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 that's that, a very tactile sensation of pleasure right that's that is that stuff is what it is uh, cognitive capability there are certain things that human minds can do and certain things that they sort of can't do and certain things they do really well and certain things they don't do very well um, and again there are some differences from individual to individual but the differences aren't really that extreme in the grand scheme of things uh, practical reason everybody has to uh, uh, you know everybody has goals and they have to decide how to achieve those goals Right. Again, no matter what culture you're in, your goals might be different. Uh, uh, ways of achieving them might be might be differently uh, viewed by different cultural contexts. But the fact that you have goals and you try and achieve them, that doesn't appear to be culturally relative. That appears to be universal. The process of early infant development, what infants do and when they're able to do it. That's biology. That's not culture. Uh, and affiliation, no matter what culture you're in, you're going to you're going to affiliate with people in some way, shape or form. Right. That's, you know, or if you choose not to, that's going to be for some recognizable reason. OK. And also uh, humor. Actually, this is one that fits very well with Aristotle. Uh, humor thought that one of the unique things about humans was that we laugh. We we do appear to have a sense of humor. And again, which things people tend to find funny. Right. How humor manifests itself may be very different in one culture versus another. Uh, but the fact of humor, it is what it is. Okay, so so this is the way that, that Nussbaum really tries to answer this this uh, uh, relativist challenge is by saying, look, if we base, if we sort of you know modify Aristotle's method a little bit or abstract out from Aristotle's method a little bit and start with these universal spheres, then we can talk about virtues, uh, virtues with respect to morality, like you know good ways of, of dealing with it versus sort of bad ways of dealing with it, good ways of dealing with your own body uh, versus bad ways of dealing with your own body. Again, those things are entirely objective. Um, uh, they, 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 they aren't culturally relative. And so uh, basing a system of virtues on a list like this one uh, would be having a set of completely non-relative virtues. And so her, her account then says that virtue ethics is not relativism in disguise, uh, even if some expressions of virtue ethics might involve some things that are culturally relative, right? That can be fixed. We can uh, continue to improve the theory in this way. And so in summary, uh, I, I'd like to just say a, a few things that, that the, 
there's a, there's an awful lot of detail in this particular lecture. And I, I, I don't think that sort of one trip through this, uh, through the text or one trip through this uh, little video here uh, is really enough to, to get the full uh, idea of all the nuance here. Certainly this uh, lecture cannot replace uh, a very careful look at the reading material. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, but in the end, okay, uh, what, what, You'll, you're, you're certainly going to want to know all of this detail here, which uh, what objections there are, what responses there are to those objections. You know, you want to know that backward and forward because that's 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 what this course is. Um, but uh, uh, the summary here, I think if you're going to hit the highlights, the most important things to focus on, the most important things to make sure you have a pretty good understanding of. And, and if you don't, to start asking questions about is uh, that virtue ethics uh, is ab absolutely more difficult to use as a practical moral guide uh, than other sorts than, than modest moral theories, right? So virtue ethics shares a feature with um, with pluralist theories in that it, it's not a handy dandy formula, right? That's true, okay? And and there's there's you know they have a reasonable reply, right? Uh, but um, but but that's that's something that is true of virtue ethics. It's also true that virtue ethics uh, up holds up a, a very demanding ideal just like utilitarian moral theory does. Uh, and you might wonder whether it's too demanding. That might be a reasonable thing to wonder. Uh, but of course, the virtue ethicist, uh, just like the utilitarian, has at least a reasonable reply. And also, uh, virtue ethics is sometimes accused of being nothing more than relativism in disguise. This is a very serious challenge uh, to virtue ethics, but it's a, a serious challenge with a very serious response that may do a lot uh, to tell us how to operate uh, uh, with virtue ethics um, in the future. And so, in, uh, as you as you move on, um, uh, we, you, know, you can you can uh, uh, see that we're going to later uh, in in the course talk about some examples of uh, how to make virtue ethics work. Right? We'll see some uh, some people who write about you know here's here's how to take an issue and and really apply virtue ethics to it uh, and and use virtue ethics to help to tell you what to do or or more importantly uh, tell you how to be.